Amen. Last week, as we gathered together, student pastor Tori shared with us about the seventh station of the cross, when Jesus carried his own cross. This week in our Lenten series, we are jumping from the seventh station to the twelfth station, the station titled Care. And the text is John 19, 25 through 27, but I think it's essential that we don't skip over what's in the middle between what happened last week and what happens this week, because it's really important. So I'm going to read to you John 19, 17 through 27. Listen for God's word for you. Listen for God's word for the world. So they took Jesus. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to the place that was called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man says, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothes they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, Here is your son. And then to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is the word of the Lord. This is it. This is the story of the crucifixion. This is the story that for so, so, so many Christians forms the heart of their understanding of their faith. Growing up, I loved this story partially because I loved Good Friday worship. Because it was always the most dramatic service in our worship year when I was growing up. Worship included dimming the lights down low, listening to the story of scripture, watching as someone slammed a book closed, and then singing my favorite song as a kid, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I think Good Friday was the first time that I ever cried in church for reasons other than not getting what I wanted. (laughs) It's then that it hit home for me, that God loved me so much that God would give up something really important to be with me. Good Friday is what I would say for a really long time when I was asked what my favorite holiday was. I am a weird church nerd, and I have always been such. 
But I will have to admit that it's not, uh, wasn't my favorite holiday just because of the church worship service. But because during the day, before church, we would have at our house what my mom called our Good Friday celebration. On Good Friday, we would have what you would all call an Easter egg hunt. How can there be a favorite holiday without candy? But we didn't call it an Easter egg hunt because Easter had not yet happened, so it was our Good Friday celebration. And this celebration, this party, was for one whole side of my family, my dad's mom's side of the family. I got to see first, second, third, fourth cousins, people who came from all over the country. I know I'm not supposed to have favorite family members, but if I were to say I had a favorite side of the family growing up, that would be it. It was so much fun. It was a blast. And I held that sacred. I looked forward to that every year, being with those people. But then about the time I turned 10, my mom stopped just inviting that side of the family and started inviting her friends. I always felt weird about that. Didn't feel like the right group of people, the right people who were gonna be there. But my mom did it anyway, much to my protest. She invited friends. She invited her friends. She also invited my friends and the friends of family members, really basically anyone she would invite to the celebration. And I continued to love it, but it always felt a little weird, a little different to me. On a regular basis, this was the most people we would have in our house all year round, which was totally fine when the weather was good, but if it rained, as it does so often in April, we were in trouble. 70 plus people in the size house I grew up in, with kids all hyped up on sugar, not a good situation. It was a sight to be seen. Well, for me, and for my family, and all those other people that my mom invited, there was an element of fun and celebration and good tasting candy to this day. So many other people celebrate Good Friday, not as one of feasting, but as one of fasting. There's a solemnity to it. It is celebrated in quiet contemplation. Historically and presently, Byzantine Christians, Catholics, Lutherans, all fast on Good Friday. This can be an incredibly beautiful and physical way to interpret this story for ourselves when we are just given a small taste of the story of pain and suffering that comes before our liberation, before our freedom in Christ. And at the same time, in recent years, I have heard people raise questions about this story and how we celebrate this story, and I, I suspect I'm starting to hear those questions because so many of my friends are now parents. And sometimes when we tell this story of Good Friday, the story of the cross, we tell it as a story of a father who sent his son to die. And when you hear it like that, it's easy to get caught up and think, how on earth could a good parent, much less a good God, do something like that? So the questions start to roll. What is really going on here? What is this religion actually all about? Because if that's it, I'm out. And I get that. And I see that. And I've been there. I also think that that sort of interpretation is a symptom of the fact that we only have a few analogies to talk about God. The titles of a father who sent a son, father and son, are analogies to help us understand something. But, but these terms only capture a fraction of what is going on inside of the Trinity. This isn't a literal father-son relationship. In fact, it is so, so important for us to hold on to what the Gospel of John says at the beginning of the book about Jesus. 
It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. If we get lost in the one analogy of Father and Son, and I think sometimes we do this, and it's fair that we do this, because it's hard to believe the fact, the thing that the Gospel of John is telling us at the beginning, that Jesus, in fact, himself is not just God's Son. Jesus is God. It's hard to believe. Whole councils of the churches have argued about this for eons. But in John's understanding, in the gospel that we've been following for this this season of Lent, what's happening is not a father forcing Jesus to do something. As we've seen in the stories we've encountered over the last weeks, Jesus has the control. Jesus, because he is God and is capable of doing so, is actively choosing to absorb the anger and pain and fear of this world so that you and I don't have to. And in so doing, he makes a way for us to build something new. And I think it's clear here in John's Gospel that the something new he is making a way for is for us to build a new kind of family. The scripture lesson says this, When from the cross Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then to the disciple he said, Here is your mother. You have heard me talk about this concept. A couple of weeks ago I talked about this. I shared how many interpreters see this moment as the culmination of a myriad of birth imagery that is found all over the Gospel of John. From his conversation with Nicodemus and the second birth to the image of the womb in John 7, John is filling us with expectation for the birth of something through Jesus. John is offering an expansion of the analogy of father and son to the image of God as mother, Jesus as mother, or at least a son who gives birth. Whichever way we try to parse this understanding of gendered analogies and imagery, there's a theologian, Lynn Tonstad, who reiterates the important thing that here at the foot of the cross, out of the flow of blood and water, out of the hole in Jesus' side, the church is born. Jesus makes a new family, a new kind of family, starting with his beloved disciple, and his mom. Woman, here is your son. Friend, here is your mother. I'm really into this idea. So when I preached at St. Alphonse's, I talked about the idea that maybe Jesus has always been building this thing that we now see being born at the foot of the cross. I called it then a family. A family made up of friends, something others have called a chosen family. This family or this chosen family is a concept that I think has been around for a really, really long time. We see it with Ruth and Naomi when Ruth says, Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Through Ruth and Naomi... And Ruth's place in the genealogy of Jesus, there is an important reminder that Jesus' own family starts with a chosen family. A family not first united by biology or by marriage, but by choice. While this concept has been around for a long period of time, the term chosen family is a term that has been attributed to a group of people a little more recently to those who have been rejected by their families because of their gender identity or sexual orientation. Because for many folks in the queer community, being their true selves has led to a loss of family. They have had 
to make choices to create their own. And I think this is something we can learn, that we can learn from. It is a valuable concept for us all, maybe first and foremost for those who have been rejected or experienced distance in their relationships with their family, maybe because of their gender or sexuality, but maybe it's because they have a change in ideology or politics or there was a falling out or a death or a divorce or a cross-country move. There's a distance, so a choice needs to be made. And this isn't something just for young people. I think all of those categories I named sometimes can sort of be pocketed for young people. But I think this is something that folks of all ages need. People whose kids have had to create some space or who have moved across the country for a job or for school or for older folks who have moved into a nursing home and don't have their normal community of support right around them anymore, or who have no more living relatives and who are starting to lose friends. There's a whole spectrum of reasons a chosen family could be important. And what I want to point out is that I don't think this is just an important idea because it is a necessity. Because you need somebody to watch your kids when you have to go to the doctor's office or to take you to the doctor's office because you've got a hip thing going on. Or who will listen to you talk about the difficulties of being a mom and parenting. It is important because there is a necessity to it, yes. And it is important because the concept of chosen family moves family from being something you have to do to something you get to do. I see in the chosen families I have the joy and pleasure to be a part of and around, or here actually, things like I get to have family dinner instead of what I feel like I often say, which is I have to have family dinner. And I think this is not only an important concept for those chosen families that exist, but it is also an important concept for our biological families. It is an important reminder that choice is always an important part of family. You have to choose to love. You have to choose to lean into the tough conversations, to show up when your, your person is hurting, to name when you yourself are hurting. In family, you have the agency always to choose. Because love is always a choice. And choice is the gift of love. Duty is only honorable if it's rooted in desire, and without that desire, that love is bondage. Now, this doesn't mean that the choice of love is always easy. Once again, we are standing at the foot of the cross as we are talking about it. It is not easy work. And yet, according to the Gospel of John, this is the choice that Jesus makes. A choice not out of a desire to die, but a desire to love. Laying the foundation for and giving birth to this chosen family at the foot of the cross is something I think Jesus did for a lot of reasons, partially to upend the social order of his Greco-Roman world, and I think the social order of our world. And I think this is literally so. Uh, the Greco-Roman world had a pretty clear structure for what comprised a family and how wealth and assets and safety and security were transferred and understood within that structure. And then at this moment, when that Greco-Roman world, that very structure, seems to be trying to stamp out the good news of Jesus' life for all people, Jesus uses a procedure for adoption buried deep within Roman law to signify the continuation of his identity, the continuation of his mission, of God's mission. 
He subverted the system. He used the systems of government that were putting him to death to ensure the line of his life, establishing a model of the life of Christ where one cares for members of the community in the same way that one cares for their own family. Through this, Jesus continues God's life, God's mission in the world, through this model of family, chosen family. On those good Fridays, as a kid, when my mom started inviting friends instead of just biological family, I was a little weirded out. Because I wanted those celebrations to be for a special set of people who I deemed to be the appropriate ones smashed into the house when it was raining. But that's not what Jesus does here in this text. There at the foot of the cross, Christ upends the social order and gives birth to a family of faith. And this is a family of faith that is made up of a biological family, as well as a family of friends. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is doing right here, right now, in this room. Y'all, there is quite the cast of characters in here. There are people who have been here for their entire lives, generations upon generations of people. There are people who have been here for 30 plus years. There are people who just walked in here for the first time. There are a bunch of church nerds, kind of like me. There are people who only show up to church because that's what their mom did. There are people who are really unsure why they walked in today. Regardless of the reason you've been drawn here, maybe it's by some, some strange string of choices that you made, but I suspect it's by some sort of love. And that is a love that can grow. That is a love that can upend a social order that tells us the world needs to be one way. That is a love that in some way says to you, from the cross, you, mother, that is your son. You, friend, that is your mother. Amen.